out on the crossroads where two roads intersect, he sees a guy driving a chariot like a bat out of Hades. Oedipus is a kid of some stubbornness, pride. He tells the guy, get out of the way. The guy in the chariot says, you get out of the way. Neither will give in. The old man pulls the chariot up. His servant on the back of the chariot runs and goes and hides. He's seen this old man lose his temper before. The two of them fight. In Oedipus, he kills the old man. He has no idea that the old man is Laius, king of Thebes, his father. He doesn't know. See, it'd be one thing if this was a play where a kid wakes up in the morning and says, gee, I think today I'll kill my dad and marry my mom and have four kids. Uh-uh. That's not this play. He never knows he's killed his dad. He goes down the road a little bit, sitting at the crossroads as a terrible monster, we call his Sphinx, who's asking a famous riddle, what animal in the morning walks on four legs, in the noontime walks on two legs, and in the evening walks on three legs. Oedipus is a pretty sharp cookie, and he says, ah, you're speaking in metaphor. I know what this game is. You're talking about a human being. In the morning of a human being's life, the child crawls on four legs. In the noontime, walks on two legs, as I am. But in the evening of a man's life, he has to get a stick, a walking stick, a cane, therefore three legs. The Sphinx says, wow, you're some sharp cookie. I'll leave Thebes. The plague that he had put the city under is gone. Out of the city comes the queen of the city, the beautiful Jacusta, who has just been informed that her husband has been killed during one more of his fighting rants. She sees the beautiful young man, handsome, stunningly handsome, and she says, hey, would you, would you like to marry me and become king of, of Thebes? Oedipus is thinking, I'm, this is the best day of my life, with the exception of having to jack that old man, but he got what he deserved. This is the best day of my life. He does marry her. And they have four children, two sons and two daughters, the perfect four for a Greek audience, right? Polynices and Eutocles, his two sons, right? And Ismene and Antigone, his two daughters. None of this information is told in the play Oedipus Rex. All of this leads up to the play. The play begins on the day of the terrible plague that has hit the city of Thebes again. Tiresias is going to tell Oedipus, the problem is that the other king, Laius, he was murdered, and the murderer is never brought to, to justice. And until that happens, the city's under play. Oedipus stands in front of the city of Thebes and says, dark irony, I will find out who murdered the king, Laius, and he will not go unpunished. I will get to the bottom of this. Dark irony. The way I've tried to capture this, and again, notice, that's why this play elicits such powerful catharsis. It would be like you going off and you're single to college, where you meet your significant other at a party. It is amazing. You even finish each other's sentences and stuff. Immediately you fall in love. You marry. You have four children. Your life is stunningly great. And then all of a sudden you get an email that says, at birth... You were a twin. But because of the dynamics of your birth, your twin and you were separated and raised in two different families. And you're like, no way. I'm a twin. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm going to go and find out who my twin is. And you begin the research. Come to find out. You find out you and your twin actually went to the same college. What are the odds? By the way, for those of you who are Star Wars fans, you already know this story. That's why, of course, in the early Star Wars films, you have that sexual tension going on between the very young Luke Skywalker and that young princess. Of course, they can't in any way consummate that. Why? Because they're twins and they were separated at birth, correct? This is a very ancient story type, right? It's a very ancient motif. The story will finish tragically. Onto the stage will come messengers, right at the end of the play. Good news. Your mom, dad, and Corinth are dead. Sad, but good, because now you don't have to worry about killing them and marrying your mom and all that wretchedness. Second messenger. 
He's the guy. I saw, I saw, the, I saw who killed the king. Liz, at the crossroads. He's the guy, that guy right there. Oedipus turns around to find his wife, mother, Jacusta. She's gone. He leaves the stage. A messenger will come back onto the stage. Sophocles couldn't show what the messenger will then say. That Jacusta went into her bedroom and in shame she hung herself. Oedipus finds her dead. He takes the brooch pins that hold her dress up, long pokey things on the back. He shoves them into his eyes. He blinds himself. And when we see Oedipus at the end of this play, ending low, he comes onto the stage without sight. Uh -huh, note the irony. At the moment Oedipus loses his sight, he finally sees. Right? It's the oh poop moment. <laughs> oh, poop. And the audience collectively goes, we knew this was coming. Of course, the audience has two immediate responses. First is fear. That would be, I mean, can you imagine falling in love with somebody who's perfect for you only to discover after the fact that it's your twin? After the fact. It's not like you went, oh yeah, I'm going to go find my twin and marry him or her and then have four kids. No, 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 none of that. Your life is going perfect and then all of a sudden you discover it. But then there's the second response, the pity, the sympathy that you feel like, oh man. Your whole life at the end of the play, Jacustus brother, Creon, will take over the throne. Oedipus is led off stage. His two sons have left to go outside and fight to see who can take over the throne. His daughter Ismene has run off. She's a coward. The only one left is Antigone, who will lead him off stage, the broken, blind, ruined old man. Now, Aristotle said this was the greatest of plays. Okay? Because in this play, an audience will go through the process of identifying with Oedipus's fall. What leads to his fall? Excessive pride. I will get to the bottom of this no matter what. Jacusta, halfway through the play, starts to kind of figure it out. She's like, honey, honey, let's just leave this alone. No, no, no. I'm a good king. I'm going to take care of my people. See, it's all honorable. This is why it's so hard. This play is so hard for Greek audiences. They're like... Man, they really pull for Oedipus, but they understand he's, oh man, he's jacked. He's jacked. And of course, in many ways, Sophocles invents the idea of irony. Dramatic irony. We kind of know that when Oedipus steps to the front of the stage and says, I will get to the bottom of this, and whoever killed the king will be punished, and we realize he's talking about himself. Irony. Now, a few years later, Shakespeare will pick up the same line of thought. Okay? He'll play very similar games. We should point out that it's clear, or we, can, we kind of have a sense that it's clear, that Aristotle defined tragedy as the movement of the protagonist from high to low, ruined. Comedy for Aristotle was the opposite, where the protagonist begins low, a nobody, and ends high, a somebody. Shakespeare will play a similar game. Let's define Shakespearean tragedy and comedy. I was asked about what kind of drugs was, there, was Shakespeare on when he wrote Othello. We can answer now, in academic language, what makes Othello the play, a tragedy, by applying the ideas of Aristotle's poetics to that play. For example, is Othello a servant? No, he's a king. High or low does he begin the play? Very high, correct? By the end of the play, what has he done? The most remarkable of things. He's taken the life of the individual who he loves the most because he fears she's messed around on him. The audience, of course, knows otherwise, and they know that Desdemona is the perfect picture of chastity, of faithfulness. The audience knows this. Othello doesn't know it. He will 
suffocator and then come to realize. That's the Okut moment. Oh, no way. I was set up by my best friend, who, by the way, Othello calls over 76 times in the play, Honest Iago. Honest Iago. Dark irony that the audience realizes from the very beginning Iago is a villain. He is the pure antagonist. He is the quintessential bad guy who is your best friend, says to you, no, 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 I'm totally, I totally got your back. While behind his back for the audience to see, he's holding the knife, metaphorically speaking, right? But Iago's smart, right? He doesn't, he doesn't do the actions himself. He gets somebody else to do them. And he can convince Othello by just making a little suggestion. Um, that's Demona. She like, she like hung out with Cassio, right? Yeah. yeah. Why? Oh no, 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 just one. Nothing. Nothing. I just, you know, just yeah, yeah, you know, just kind of a thing. I thought I, I don't know about your girl, but I don't know. I, she, I'm sure she, I'm sure she's a good girl. She lied, you know. She lied to you, to her dad. If she lied to her dad, she could lie to you. It's all it takes. And Othello is off running. It never occurs to him to pause for a moment and just ask a few simple questions. And in that moment, what has Shakespeare done? He's taken out a mirror and he's held it up to an audience. And he asks an audience the simple question, do we ever jump to decisions without all the information? Shoot our mouths off, do something really stupid, say something really stupid, and then have the opuk moment of, oh, no. Of course, it's too late, Bob. Relationships are ruined, et cetera, et cetera. Right? To that degree, notice how Shakespeare will create a tragedy where he begins with unity, harmony, and the play will end in complete disunity, complete harmony. Notice all of the deaths. Right? And it's all because of who? Iago? Well, this is the debate, isn't it? You could say it's because of Iago, but again, Othello, he listened, didn't he? And in that listening, allows for the potential problems. Now, let's define real quickly Shakespearean comedy. Midsummer Night's Dream is an example of Shakespearean comedy. This, this is a different kind of play. If in tragedy, Shakespeare begins with order and ends in disorder from high to low, for Shakespeare, comedy is the opposite. The play will always begin with disorder, some kind of problem, silliness. And then at the end of the play, Shakespeare will come to harmony or unity. Now for Shakespeare, the greatest example of that in his comedies is weddings. Notice in Midsummer Night's Dream, you have multiple weddings, which means ultimate harmony, correct? But what's interesting about the play Midsummer Night's Dream is that the most important part of the play is what often modern viewers think is the wasted time of the play, the end of the play. They enjoy all the stuff that happens in the middle of the play, in the woods. It's the first play of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, of course. You have, of course, Bottom's head being changed into the head of a donkey or an ass, which is, of course, another word for Bottom. Ha ha, it's so funny. But what's important is the very end of the play. Why is Bottom and the actors in the woods in the first place? They are there to practice performing a play. What play? Not just any play. They are there to practice the performance of a play, Pyramus Thisbe. A story from what culture? The Greek culture. A famous Greek myth about two lovers who grow up on two different sides of the wall in their houses, in their estates. They never get to see each other. They only talk through a hole in the wall and they decide to run away. They will meet in the woods, Pyramus Thisbe. We'll meet in the woods. However, they don't go together. They go separate. When Pyramus shows up, he believes Thisbe has been killed by a lion in his great tragic rage. 
he draws his own sword and kills himself. He cannot live without his girl. She, of course, discovers that he has killed himself, and she can't live without her guy. And wait a minute, this sounds like a tragedy we heard of once called Romeo and Juliet, written by who? Shakespeare. Shakespeare so influenced by this motif. Notice how he will inject this motif of Pyramus Thisbe slash Romeo and Juliet into the comedy of Midsummer Night's Dream, right? Only notice that in Midsummer Night's Dream, it's all kind of fun and games. Bottom, as played by Klein in the performance that you watched, has a hey time, lots of fun and games, right? Playing the game of, uh, of you know, the Pyramus Thisbe motif. In the end, though, notice in the comedy, we end with unity, we end with harmony, everything works itself out. Years later, America is a growing and a dynamic country. By the 1950s, it is time to begin to ask serious questions about our institutions. One of the ways we do that in America is through our art. It's been so from the very beginning. From the very beginning, art was a way to ask questions about our fundamental existence. Back to Aristotle's view in poetics. What makes us human is our capacity to go to a film, to go to a play, and to derive some kind of powerful cathartic feeling. Arthur Miller will write the classic play of the dysfunctional family. By the time he's writing this play, the American dream is understood to be get a job, work really hard, make lots of money, buy a house, buy a car, raise a family, and be happy, be successful. But Miller was already aware that there was some real difficulty at times about understanding the way a man's desire for stuff begins to affect the way he can parent, the way he can live. So he writes a play about a man named Willie Loman, young or old. It's significant that he's old. He's lived his whole life trying to amass wealth, trying to amass a reputation. Remember what he says about Bernard? He's liked, but he's not well-liked. He wants to be respected. His model is a wealthy businessman who could go into his hotel room and make deals from the phone. And when he died, thousands of people came to his funeral. He had what uh, Willie Loman will call the death of a salesman. Willie Loman is convinced that when he dies, he'll have the same kind of respect, the same kind of reputation. Of course, we know otherwise. Just like in Oedipus Rex, just like in Othello, as we sit and watch this play, we already know from the title, it ain't gonna be pretty. The title of the play is Death of a Salesman. You, you have to be a pretty dull viewer of this play to be shocked that at the end of the play, Willie Loman commits suicide. But sitting at the heart of the play is a certain kind of dysfunctionalism within the family. Driven by what? What is at the heart of the play? What is it early on? Linda will ask, Biff, what is it between you and your father? What is it between he and his father? That's true. But what is it that Biff sees when he goes to Boston and he walks oh, in? Dad. He does, doesn't he? He walks in on his father and his father has a mistress. And in that moment, Biff's respect for his father ruined. And Biff throws away his life. He can't do anything again. There were critics of this play who said, no way, come on, this cannot be true. A son cannot be that jacked up by seeing his father in an, in an affair. And yet Miller seems to suggest that there's levels of psychic pathology which are not so easily explained and that Biff is traumatized by the experience, and he never can get over it. But then neither can Willie Loman. But what is sitting even deeper in the pathology is, of course, dishonesty, right? Willie Loman is incapable of admitting that the reason his son Biff has 
fallen is because of Willie's excessive pride. We're back to hubris. Loman has pride, not unlike Othello's pride, not unlike Oedipus's pride. Loman cannot admit that what he did in having this mistress, notice for Biff it wasn't so much the mistress, it was the stockings that come to symbolize, you gave her mama stockings, to which Willie says, I gave you an order, and the son will call him a fake. You're not real. You are a fake. And because you're a fake, I can't respect you. And because I can't respect you, I can't respect myself. And because I can't respect myself, I'm lost. Even at the end of the play, standing next to the recent grave of Willie Loman, no one's there. No one has come. Willie Loman dies a forgotten man. But notice still the family is grappling with how to deal with the passing of Willie Loman. Was he a hero or was he a coward? One son will say, I'm going to follow in dad's footsteps. That's happy, huh? Biff says, I got to get out of this town and I got to go make a life for myself. Notice the final lines of Linda Loman, free and clear. Does Willie's death provide freedom to this family? Or do you have a sense that this is just going to be more drama, more pathology going forward? In other words, we maybe don't get out so easy. This is a, again, deeply difficult play for an audience in 1950 to watch. This play continues to have a remarkable run. You can go to New York City tonight and this play will be performed somewhere in that city. People continue to go to this play because it is a compelling reminder of what it means to live in a family where you learn to love, but sometimes you also learn to hate. Where you learn respect, but sometimes you also learn disgust and disrespect. The other institution that will be challenged will of course be the institution of gender relations. And in the play Trifles, we find a remarkable, simple little play that looks in many ways very much like a Greek drama. Notice only four characters. The woman who has strangled her husband never appears. Mrs. Notice the name, right? When you hear her name spoken on stage, you immediately think of R-I-G-H-T. Of course, her actual spelling is W-R-I-G-H-T. This text being Glasgow's text so powerful that she publishes it not only as a text called Trifles a Play, but also as a short story, Jury of Her Peers, which is one of the texts we're reading for, for next meeting. But notice what's fascinating about this play. You have a woman who has committed an act strangling her husband in his sleep. She now sits in a jail cell. Two women show up to provide her with some necessities, Two men show up to try and find out what went wrong. Evidence. They can't find any evidence, though. But the women do. What is the evidence that they find? What happened to Miss Wright? Well, there's a story here, isn't there? When she married her husband, she was a young, beautiful, free bird singing in the church choir. Her husband, however, moves her to a farm outside of Omaha. She is going to live alone. And slowly she begins to die. Her spirit begins to die. But the penultimate moment has to do with what the women find. First of all, a cage, a bird cage, empty, but a broken door. And then they find a small yellow bird whose neck has been wrenched. The bird is now dead. They deduce what? What do they imagine must have happened? Daddy came home, didn't like the bird singing in the cage, took the bird out of the cage, and what? Jacked her bird. She decided enough is enough. Of course, some knots in her sewing are the giveaway. And she then decided to go up and to strangle the man to death as payback leading to a really difficult question in the mind of the audience. Again, catharsis playing a powerful moment here. When the question is, did she do the right thing? Does she have a right if she has been attacked spiritually, psychologically, 
emotionally, not physically, maybe. Does she have a right to take his life? Classic texts like The Burning Bed will follow in film version where an abused woman will burn her husband alive. Trifles gather tremendous support of a debate that became part of the feminist debate. If a man treats his woman poorly, does she have a right to respond with violence? So there you go. From the Greeks to the moderns, drama asking very difficult questions of an audience that then must respond with powerful emotions of fear and pity. Thank you. So uh, let's now call that the end of our session.